We begin with serious news here. Fox News alert. We're awaiting President Trump at the White House, where he is set to unveil a long-awaited Middle East peace plan. We're also less than an hour away from the president's defense team wrapping up opening statements in the impeachment trial. The president will be joined by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for today's big announcement. The proposal we know ahead of it calls for a two-state solution if the Palestinians reach certain bench benchmarks. However, Palestinian leaders already say they are objecting to the plan. And around and around we go. You're watching Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner. Here today, Melissa Francis. Town Hall editor, Fox News contributor, Katie Pavlich. Iona College political science professor, Jeannie Zeno. In the center seat, our friend Guy Benson, Fox News contributor, host of the Guy Benson radio show. We say he's outnumbered. Uh, we'll bring it out to the couch in just a second. Let's do this first, though. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live now with the latest on all of this. John, a big day shaping up. It is. No question about that, Harrison. Good afternoon to you. Many presidents have tried and every president has failed to develop a comprehensive Middle East plan. Remember, 20 years ago, Bill Clinton trial, tried and it fell apart in spectacular fashion. Well, now President Trump and the White House are going to try to do it in incremental fashion. I've seen the outline of the plans. I've actually seen a map of what this will all look like under the proposal. They'll be unveiling that soon. It calls for a two-state solution, the current state of Israel, and a, quote, future state state of Palestine, encompassed in a lot of the West Bank, Gaza, and two new pieces of land that will be part of land swaps that will be south of Gaza, almost along the Egyptian border. Now, the way that this will work is that the Israelis will maintain security for Israel and the Palestinian territory. The Palestinians will be allowed to develop maybe a, p a police force or something like that, but the overall security of the area will be up to Israel. And there's an arrow strip of land between the West Bank and the Jordan River, the Jordan River Valley, that will forever be Israeli sovereignty and will be uh, subject to Israeli security, though the Palestinians will be allowed at some point, if things go well, to move in there with some sort of civil sovereignty, and that might be establishing farms or, or, or other things like that. So initially, Israel will maintain control of the entire area, but over time, the Palestinians will be allowed autonomy in the West Bank and Gaza, two areas south of Gaza, and as well, very importantly, a portion of East Jerusalem, because the Palestinians have said there can be no peace deal without a capital, a Palestinian capital uh, in uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, now, one of the other things that Israel uh, is promising to do here is to suspend settlement construction for four years as a good faith measure while this plan gets rolled out. Another important thing, there are Israeli elections that are coming up on March the 2nd. Both Benjamin Netanyahu and the Blue and White Party leader, Benny Gantz, who was here at the White House yesterday, have agreed that they will implement this peace plan regardless of who wins the election. So this does seem to be something that is, at least in terms of the Middle East, a relative certainty. You said at the top of this that the Palestinians are not necessarily in favor of this plan. The president and acknowledged that yesterday, but said that when the details are rolled out, that when the plan is rolled out, he believes that the Palestinians will come along. One thing that uh, the White House wants people to know is this more than doubles the amount of territory currently under Palestinian control. So while this right. does lean in Israel's favor, this is offering a lot more White House officials say to the Palestinians than has been reported thus far. Harris? All right, John Roberts, uh, thank you very much. And of course, you're in the East Room there. And as things tick along, we'll come back uh, straight away as soon as the president takes the dais there. Let's bring it out to the couch. So we have the plan. It was embargoed until four minutes ago. Um, Melissa, what jumps out to you? So, I mean, this is the first time Israel has agreed to a Palestinian state with defined borders. And that seems like a very big deal. And I remember when the president was campaigning and he said that, number one, he wanted to move our our embassy to Jerusalem, but he also said that he might be in favor of a two-state solution, and there were people who were very upset about that. Um, at this point, you know, it looks like he's making good on this idea, and I know they say that, that Palestinians are unhappy about this already, and there are a lot of benchmarks they have to make to get there, but this, 
I don't know. I mean, you it looks what? like a decent roadmap. I, I wonder, as you say that, uh, again, um, the report is that some Palestinian leaders are not happy with this, but don't they kind of have to do their own on-the-ground political calculations just like everybody else? And do you really want to be sitting in the background going, yeah, we love America? I mean, so I sort of can get some of that, but what could they get out of this guy? Well, they could get a state, right? And that's yeah. hypothetically the final element of this that would be implemented if benchmarks were met. Look, I love the idea behind this. I think the plan as we are looking through it seems pretty reasonable in a lot what of different ways. What do you love ways. the idea behind it when you say that? I think we all love the idea of peace. The problem well, yes. is, and it's hard not to be a cynic about this situation because as John said in that report, every president for decades has attempted this and every president has failed. And really it comes down to a very simple fact in my mind. If the Palestinians had unified government, renounced violence, and recognized the right of Israel to exist, we would have peace. Until those things happen, we're not going to have peace. Jeannie? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the real question here is just what John alluded to. What more is going to be offered to the Palestinians? Because let's look at how this was rolled out. This was done without input from the Palestinians. They walked away from this because of the issue of the embassy largely, and they've been really absent from it. So now it is being put out there with Netanyahu and Gantz at his side, but no Palestinians. So the question is going to be, is this more than just a non-starter? Because without Palestinians, you don't get to peace. And there are several elements of this well, but plan. But even with Palestinians, but, we haven't but, gotten to peace is the problem. Well, you can't get there without them, right? I mean, they there's no well, question so about that. are we that. presuming that there's no back end on this? Well, like, is this the front end of something? And then it open, I don't know, I'm optimistic. Does this open the door then for Palestinian leaders to yes. come forward and say what they do want? And uh, we know this about this president. He, he makes a bold move and then right. critics in the room, critics all over the world, some liking this t situation, some hating the situation. Everybody comes out and, and they throw everything at it, but we don't know yet what the other end is. He shakes it like. up, but he, he gets the conversation going right. by proposing things that other people wouldn't propose. Katie. Yeah, Harris, on that point, I was in a background briefing last summer about this plan, and there's another plan that came out last year on the economic side of this, and Jared Kushner has approached this in the sense of trying to think outside of the box, not listening to people who are saying it's never going to work, acknowledging, you can see Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin there on the left waiting uh, for the President and Prime Minister Netanyahu to come in. Um, but back to the issue, um, they've tried to approach this knowing that it has a chance of failing. They understand it's very difficult. But I would argue that presidents in the past and world leaders and European leaders for decades have failed at this because the Palestinians have always broken their promises. The Israelis have always given up uh, information and land and uh, signed treaties that the Palestinians then mm -hmm. responded to with violence. And today, the very telling thing is, is that Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian leader, is meeting with the head of Hamas and the head of Islamic Jihad to come out with a statement against this plan. Now, when your government is made up of terrorist groups, it's very hard to meet these benchmarks, yeah. which are basic when it comes to what they're asking for. They're asking well, for a lack of violence and, and just and an economic activity. Not to miss the point from what you're just saying, those groups coming together and you mentioned terrorism, um, you know, post the news that was breaking on Iran, not even right. 10 days ago, mm -hmm. we, we knew that some of those groups were going to come together anyway. I mean, there was some pretty strong reporting that, that they were having conversations and, and that the key point in the center is that they hate us. Um, so to see us come out with a plan like this, I wonder, too, if that doesn't force those groups to do something that they really haven't done, Guy. They don't work in concert. You know? And that's, that is also part of the problem, as, as Katie alluded to. So I think I don't want to minimize at all the very hard work that Jared Kushner has put into this plan. And as we comb through the various elements of it, I think it's a very good starting point. I think to dismiss it out of hand, the Palestinians, I think, have a very weak bargaining position at this particular moment in time, I think would be a mistake. I also think it's a mistake to have terrorist organizations running a large segment of your government in the Gaza Strip. I mean, there are just huge, implacable obstacles to peace, which is not to say it shouldn't which be Which is attempted. why probably we haven't seen it yet. Well, right? and, 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 yeah. and I want to just do a quick scene setter. You heard Katie telling us a, a few people that we saw into uh, are on the right side of the room. You see Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Also, some of the president's legal team, we saw Alan Dershowitz there as well. The president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, has just been introduced. They are introducing uh, 
obviously his presence here and we can hear listen to that hail to the chief is playing and that is benjamin netanyahu who is with him the head of uh israel and he's here the prime minister is here uh on a visit and now there for the laying out of the middle east peace plan um, they have been holding events since yesterday and now this is a very seminal moment. We've been talking about how the peace hasn't happened in that part of the world. And now for the president to be part of that and, and possibly leading it um, is a big moment. Let's watch President Trump. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, Israel takes a big step towards peace. Young people across the Middle East are ready for a more hopeful future. And governments throughout the region are realizing that terrorism and Islamic extremism are everyone's common enemy. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of meeting with both the Prime Minister of Israel and a man that's working very hard to become the Prime Minister of Israel in the longest-running election of all time, <laughs> Benny Gantz of the Blue and White Party. And both leaders joined me to express their support for this effort, proving that the State of Israel looking for peace and that peace transcends politics by any measure, unmeasurable, that's what they want. On my first trip overseas as president, I visited the Holy Land of Israel. I was deeply moved and amazed by what this small country had achieved in the face of overwhelming odds and never-ending threats. The State of Israel comprises only a minuscule amount of land in the Middle East, and yet it has become a thriving center of democracy, innovation, culture, and commerce. Israel is a light unto the world. The hearts and history of our people are woven together. The land of Israel is an ancient home, a sacred place of worship, and a solemn promise to the Jewish people that we will never again repeat history's darkest hour. During my trip to Israel, I also met with Palestinian President Abbas in Bethlehem. I was saddened by the fate of the Palestinian people. They deserve a far better life. They deserve the chance to achieve their extraordinary potential. Palestinians have been trapped in a cycle of terrorism, poverty, and violence, exploited by those seeking to use them as pawns to advance terrorism and extremism. I returned from my visit determined to find a constructive path, and it's got to be a very powerful path forward in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To further this effort, I also met with President Abbas at the White House. Forging peace between Israelis and Palestinians may be the most difficult challenge of all. All prior administrations from President Lyndon Johnson have tried and bitterly failed. But I was not elected to do small things or shy away from big problems. It's been a long and very arduous process to arrive at this moment. On Sunday, I delivered to Prime Minister Netanyahu my vision for peace, prosperity, and a brighter future for the Israelis and Palestinians. This vision for peace is fundamentally different from past proposals. In the past, even the most well-intentioned plans were light on factual details and heavy on conceptual frameworks. 
By contrast, our plan is 80 pages and is the most detailed proposal ever put forward by far. As I have seen throughout my long career as a dealmaker, complex problems require nuanced, fact-based remedies. That is why our proposal provides precise technical solutions to make Israelis, Palestinians, and the region safer and much more prosperous. My vision presents a win-win opportunity for both sides, a realistic two-state solution that resolves the risk of Palestinian statehood to Israel's security. Today, Israel has taken a giant step toward peace. Yesterday, Prime Minister Netanyahu informed me that he is willing to endorse the vision as the basis for direct negotiations. And I will say the general also endorsed and very strongly with the Palestinians a historic breakthrough. And likewise, we have really uh, a situation having to do with a race that is taking place right now, it will end, and we have the support, and it's very important to say this, of both parties and almost all people in Israel. They want peace, and they want peace badly. This is the first time Israel has authorized the release of a conceptual map illustrating the territorial compromises it's willing to make for the cause of peace, and they've gone a long way. This is an unprecedented and highly significant development. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for having the courage to take this bold step forward. And, B.B., we have a lot of powerful people in this room, a lot of the people that can help make it work. So that's quite a thunderous applause. Thank you Thank very you much. Well. Thank you. We will form a joint committee with Israel to convert the conceptual map into a more detailed and calibrated rendering so that recognition can be immediately achieved. We will also work to create a contiguous territory within the future Palestinian state for when the conditions for statehood are met, including the firm rejection of terrorism. <laughs> Under this vision, Jerusalem will remain Israel's undivided very important. Undivided capital. But that's no big deal, because I've already done that for you, right? We've already done that, but that's okay. It's going to remain that way. And the United States will recognize Israeli sovereignty over the territory that my vision provides to be part of the State of Israel. Very important. And crucially, the proposed transition to a two-state solution will present no incremental security risk to the State of Israel whatsoever. 
We will not allow a return to the days of bloodshed, bus bombings, nightclub attacks, and relentless terror. Won't be allowed. Peace requires compromise, but we will never ask Israel to compromise its security. Can't do that. As everyone knows, I have done a lot for Israel moving the United States Embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing <laughs> recognizing the Golan Heights, and frankly, perhaps most importantly, getting out of the terrible Iran nuclear deal. There's a lot of spirit in this room. It's true. You don't see it often. You don't see it often. Therefore, it is only reasonable that I have to do a lot for the Palestinians, or it just wouldn't be fair. Now, don't clap for that, okay? But it's true. It wouldn't be fair. I want this deal to be a great deal for the Palestinians. It has to be. Today's agreement is a historic opportunity for the Palestinians to finally achieve an independent state of their very own. After 70 years of little progress, this could be the last opportunity they will ever have, and last for a lot of reasons. We'll never have a team like we have right now. We have a team of people that love the United States, and they love Israel, and they're very smart and very, very committed from your ambassador, David Friedman. <laughs> to Jason and Avi and Jared. <laughs> and they're all great dealmakers, and they also understand the other side. And they want the other side to do well, because that's the sign of a great deal. And they understand that. And I just appreciate all of the hard work you put in, and so many of your other friends, and, of course, our great Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Whoa. Oh, that's impressive. That was very impressive, Mike. <laughs> that reporter couldn't have done too good a job on you yesterday, huh? I think you did a good job on her, actually. That's good. Thank you, Mike. Great. Very — are you running for uh, Senate? I guess the answer is no after that, huh? They all want him to. Kansas, great state. They want him to. But you're doing a great job. Don't move. The Palestinian people have grown distrustful after years of unfulfilled promises. So true. Yet I know they are ready to escape their tragic past and realize a great destiny. But we must break free of yesterday's failed approaches. This map will more than double the Palestinian territory and provide a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem, where America will proudly open an embassy. No Palestinians or Israelis will be uprooted from their homes. Israel will work closely with a wonderful person, a wonderful man, the King of Jordan, to ensure that the status quo of the Temple Mount is preserved and strong measures are taken to ensure that all Muslims who wish to visit peacefully and pray at the Al-Aqwa Mosque will be able to do so. This is a major statement. This is of major importance. And at the same time, our vision will deliver a massive commercial investment of $50 billion into the new Palestinian state. You have many, many countries that want to partake in this, and uh, many of them are surrounding. They all want this to happen. Virtually every one of them want this to happen. And I think, Bibi, you know that very well. You're going to have tremendous support from your neighbors and beyond your neighbors. 
over the next 10 years, if executed well, one million great new Palestinian jobs will be created. Their poverty rate will be cut in half, and their poverty rate is unacceptable now and only getting worse. Their GDP will double and triple, and much-needed hope, joy, opportunity, and prosperity will finally arrive for the Palestinian people. Our vision will end the cycle of Palestinian dependency upon charity and foreign aid. They will be doing phenomenally all by themselves. They are a very, very capable people. And we will help by empowering the Palestinians to thrive on their own. Palestinians will be able to seize the new future with dignity, self-sufficiency, and national pride. To ensure a successful Palestinian state, we are asking the Palestinians to meet the challenges of peaceful coexistence. This includes adopting basic laws enshrining human rights, protecting against financial and political corruption, stopping the malign activities of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other enemies of peace, ending the incitement of hatred against Israel, so important, and permanently halting the financial compensation to terrorists. And perhaps most importantly, my vision gives the Palestinians the time needed to rise up and meet the challenges of statehood. I sent a letter today to President Abbas. I explained to him that the territory allocated for his new state will remain open and undeveloped for a period of four years. During this time, Palestinians can use all appropriate deliberation to study the deal, negotiate with Israel, achieve the criteria for statehood, and become a truly independent and wonderful state. President Abbas, I want you to know that if you choose the path to peace, America and many other countries, will we, we will be there. We will be there to help you in so many different ways. And we will be there every step of the way. We will be there to help. In other words, for the first time in many, many decades, I can say, it will work. It's going to work. If they do this, it will work. Your response to this historic opportunity will show the world to what extent you are ready to lead the Palestinian people to statehood. The Middle East is changing rapidly. On my first trip aboard as President, I traveled to Saudi Arabia to discuss our shared priorities with the 54 leaders of the Muslim and Arab countries. I made clear that all civilized nations share the same goals, stamping out extremism, creating opportunity for the region's youth. And we have to take care of the region's youth. The region's youth is growing up with no hope. We have to take care of the region's youth and existing in harmony with one's neighbors. Since that time, immense progress has been made. A growing number of nations have taken strong stands against terrorism and radicalization. You see it. Thanks to the courage of U.S. forces, the ISIS territorial caliphate, 100 percent, not 95 percent, not 99 or any other percent, 100 percent of the caliphate, ISIS, is destroyed. And its savage leader, al-Baghdadi, is now dead. And I want to thank — we have some of our great senators and congressmen and women here, and I want to thank you all for the tremendous help. Thank you very much, Jim, Ted, everybody, Steve. Our leader. Leader, thank you. Mark, thank you. Great people. These are great people. They work so hard, and they love this country. 
The Iranian regime is isolated and weakened greatly. We eliminated Qasem Soleimani, the world's top terrorist. And as you know, he was with the head of Hezbollah. I don't think they were up to anything good. I don't think so. He ran an organization called Jerusalem Liberation Forces and used his hatred, total severe hatred, of Israel as a rallying cry to divert attention from the incompetence and shortcomings of his government. He falsely promoted the sinister notion that a free Jerusalem we must really be at war with Israel. So to have it free, we have to be at war with Israel. And he said it very, very powerfully. In fact, it's been in this false war that Israel really, the enemies of peace, have used it. They just used it as an excuse to divide and totally oppress the Middle East. In truth, Jerusalem is liberated. Jerusalem is a safe, open, democratic city that welcomes people of all faiths and all places. It is time for the Muslim world to fix the mistake it made in 1948 when it chose to attack instead of recognize the new state of Israel. It's time. Since then, the amount of needless bloodshed and all squandered opportunities, so many squandered opportunities in the name of senseless causes, is beyond measure. The Palestinians have been the primary pawn in this regional adventurism, and it's time for this sad chapter in history to end, end quickly, end now. It's never too late for courageous leaders to set a new course, to pursue what is right, to change the future only for the better. America is prepared to work with all parties on our vision. So many other countries are willing, ready, and able to work with us. I've spoken to many of them. I cannot believe the amount of support this morning has. I cannot believe it. I have been called by leaders. Boris called, so many called. And they're all saying, whatever we can do to help, they all want to see it happen. But America cannot care more about peace than the stakeholders in the region. There are many Muslims who never visited Al-Aqsa, and many Christians and Jews who never visited the holy sites in the West Bank described so vividly in the Bible. My vision will change that. Our majestic biblical heritage will be able to live, breathe, and flourish in modern times. All humanity should be able to enjoy the glories of the Holy Land. This part of the world is forever connected to the human soul and the human spirit. These ancient lands should not be symbols of conflict, but eternal symbols of peace. Thank you again for all of the work you've all done and all of these incredible honored guests for being here. And in particular, I want to thank Prime Minister Netanyahu. I also want to thank Oman, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates for the incredible work they've done helping us with so much and sending their ambassadors to be with us today. Thank you very much for being here.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please give our regards. America's partnerships in the region have never been greater, and our alliance with the State of Israel has never, ever been stronger than it is today. Together, we can bring about a new dawn in the Middle East. And I would now, again, just like to thank everybody and a very special group of people, an incredible group of people. So many have been with us on this journey right from the beginning, and we're getting there. It's, uh, they say it's the toughest deal ever to make. In business, when I have a tough deal, people would say, this is tougher than the Israelis and the Palestinians. They used it as an excuse. <laughs> Meaning that was always the standard. Actually, there's nothing tougher than this one. But we have to get it done. We have an obligation to humanity to get it done. So I would now like to introduce the Prime Minister of Israel, who's worked so hard on this, Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you. We drink water before a long voyage. This is an extraordinary voyage. President Trump, Donald, I'm honored to be here today along with my wife Sarah, Minister Yariv Levine. Ambassador Ron Dermer. Ron, thank you for everything you've been doing. <laughs> National Security Advi Advisor Mayor Ben Shabbat. Thank you too, Mayor. <laughs> and our entire delegation. We are honored to be here with you, Mr. President with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We applaud you, Mike. Secretary of the Treasury Steve Mnuchin, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, America's UN Ambassador Kelly Kraft, Jared Kushner and Ivanka, it's good to see you both. It's good to see the unfailingly energetic and optimistic Ambassador David Friedman, Jason Greenblatt, Avi Berkowitz, Brian Hook, and the rest of your exceptional peace pan, Mr. President. It's good to be here with the other distinguished ladies and gentlemen of your administration, with senators and members of Congress who are Israel's greatest friends on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Thank you. With the ambassadors of the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Oman, what a pleasure to see you here. And what a sign it portends I was going to say of the future, what a sign it portends of the present. <laughs> to all of you and to the many distinguished, other distinguished guests who are here today, this is a historic day. And it recalls another historic day. We remember May 14th, 1948, 
Because on that day, President Truman became the first world leader to recognize the state of Israel after our first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, declared our independence. That day chartered a brilliant future. Mr. President, I believe that down the decades, and perhaps down the centuries, we will also remember January 28, 2020, because on this day, you became the first world leader to recognize Israel's sovereignty over areas in Judea and Samaria that are vital to our security and central to our heritage. And on this day, you too have charted a brilliant future, a brilliant future for Israelis, Palestinians, and the region by presenting a realistic path to a durable peace. Since the moment of its birth, Israel has yearned for peace with our Palestinian neighbors and peace with the broader Arab world. For decades, that peace has proved elusive, despite so many well-intentioned plans. One after the other, they failed. Why did they fail? They failed because they did not strike the right balance between Israel's vital security and national interests and the Palestinians' aspirations for self-determination. Too many plans tried to pressure Israel to withdraw from vital territory like the Jordan Valley. But you, Mr. President, you recognize that Israel must have sovereignty in the Jordan Valley and the other, and other strategic areas of Judea and Samaria. Rather than pay easy lip service to Israel's security and simply shut your eyes, hope for the best, you recognize that Israel must have sovereignty in places that enable Israel to defend itself by itself. Welcome to Washington, looking live at the White House, the Middle East peace plan by the Trump administration being unrolled. The Israeli prime minister in the middle of a, a tough re-election, an election bid, another one. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu speaking now. This is the first time uh, that there will be a defined map, a two-state solution with a contiguous Palestinian state this proposal has. Uh, the Israelis are buying into that. That's the first time that has happened. There are a number of other specifics, including monitoring, Monetary uh, efforts to entice the Palestinians, and obviously they have not yet bought into this plan, but it is ambitious as the White House rolls it out today. The president saying it's the toughest deal when it comes to foreign policy in the world, and I think that's correct. Uh, a two-state solution and the accession on that by the Israelis is a major development. However, you do not have Palestinian buy-in on this deal at this point. It's a framework uh, that they will hope to bring them into over time, and we will see uh, whether or not this leads anywhere. Obviously, both of these men in difficult political situations at the moment, um, as uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, is hoping to win a very contested tight election in Israel. March 2nd is that next uh, round of elections. And back to the big story at hand. Special coverage continuing today of the Senate impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. Live from Washington, I'm Martha McCallum. And I'm Brett Baer. President Trump's lawyers heading into their final day of opening arguments as administration officials fight off accusations reported in former National Security Advisor John Bolton's yet-to-be-released book. This as Democrats are ramping up pressure on Republicans to force Bolton and others to testify. The Justice Department now denying a report that it turned